So hopefully when you were listing down all the types of energy that you could think of, you thought about kinetic energy and potential energy. For particles, we've got different types of kinetic energy. So there's the translational kinetic energy, which is the normal half mv squared one associated with movement. And hopefully you also remembered about the rotational kinetic energy, a half i omega squared, associated with the rotation of the body. Now potential energy is not actually too important for particles because one of the assumptions of the ideal gas law was that the only forces that we needed to consider occurred in the collisions between the particles. So we don't need to worry about the gravitational force. That's because the mass of the particles is really small, so that gravitational potential energy is tiny. And we also don't have to worry about things like electrostatic fields and the potential energy associated with that when we're considering a gas which obeys those assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases. There is another type of energy associated with particles. When you've got a molecule with one or more atoms connected with a bond, we can actually have vibrational kinetic energy where the bonds vibrate and we have energy associated with that. So what we're going to do now is consider a few different types of particles. Let's start with the simplest, a monotonic atom. So this is something like a helium atom, which is just one atom by itself. Now this helium atom, can store translational kinetic energy. It can move backwards and forwards. Let's say that's the x direction. It can move up and down. Let's call that the y direction. And it can also move in and out like this. So we can say that's in the z direction. So there's actually three dimensions in which it can store this translational kinetic energy. So it, each of those dimensions is associated with what we call a degree of freedom. So degree of freedom is a way in which a molecule or an atom can store energy. So this single monotonic atom has three translational degrees of freedom. Now this atom can also rotate, but that's actually got a negligible amount of kinetic energy associated with it. The reason for that is that atoms are very small and the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus. So the nucleus of the atom is about the size of 10 to the minus 15 meters, so it's tiny. The moment of inertia for a sphere, such as this, if we model our atom as a sphere, is given by 2 on 5 mr squared. So you can see that the rotational kinetic energy, which is a half i omega squared, is going to be absolutely tiny because of the very tiny um, mass and the very, very tiny radius. And so the, any rotational kinetic energy is negligible and we don't have any degrees of freedom associated with the rotational kinetic energy for a monotonic particle or atom. Also, there's no vibrations here because we don't have any bonds for it to vibrate against, vibrate about. So this monotonic particle just has three degrees of freedom and they're associated with those, that translational movement. So it can move in the x, y and z direction. Okay, let's now consider a diatomic particle. So H2 is a common example. It's also got N2O2. So this is two atoms connected by one bond. Now in this case, it can also move in the three directions. So it can move backwards and forwards, up and down, in and out. So it has got three translational degrees of freedom. Now, this particle can also rotate. When it rotates about, let's call this the z-axis, that has got energy associated with it. It can also move about the axis this way, so like this, and that has also got energy associated with it. Now, if it, trans if it rotates about this axis, like this, there's actually very little rotational kinetic energy stored that in that way for the same reasons as before. The mass is concentrated in the nucleus with a tiny radius, and so we've got very little rotational kinetic energy stored in that way. So this diatomic molecule has two rotational degrees of freedom. Now, diatomic molecules can also vibrate. So here's another model with a spring in between, so you can see they can spring in and out like this. Now when we start it springing, 
we can set the initial kinetic energy and the initial potential energy for that oscillation. You'll be learning more about that in the oscillations topic. But because we have those two choices when starting it to vibrate, that's got two degrees of freedom associated with it. Now, an important thing about degrees of freedom is that it does actually depend on the temperature. At low temperatures, below 100 kelvins, the particles can move, so they all have the translational kinetic energy. But when they collide with other particles, they don't actually have enough energy to start those other particles rotating. So at low temperatures, below about 100 kelvin, these diatomic molecules only have the translational kinetic energy. They also do not have enough energy to start other particles vibrating. So they've just got the three translational degrees of freedom at low temperatures. In the medium range between 100 kelvins and 1000 kelvins, they do have enough energy to start other particles rotating when they collide. But they do not have enough energy to start other particles vibrating. So between 100 kelvins and 1000 kelvins, diatomic molecules have five degrees of freedom, three translational and two rotational. Above 1000 kelvins, they have enough energy to start things vibrating. And so at that point, they've got seven degrees of freedom, three translational, two rotational, and two vibrational. Okay, now, we can have more complex molecules, such as this methane molecule here. At low temperatures, this methane molecule can also move in three dimensions, and so it also has three translational degrees of freedom associated with it. This one, we can, it, it can actually rotate about three different axes, and so it also has three rotational degrees of freedom. At high temperatures, it's also going to have vibrational degrees of freedom. So for more complex molecules, Below 100 kelvins, they also only have a three degrees of freedom associated with translation. As the temperature increases, depending on the geometry of the molecule, they can have um, additional rotational degrees of freedom. And then when we get above 1000 kelvins as well, they can start vibrating and so we'll have additional degrees of freedom that way. But you won't be expected to calculate how many vibrational degrees of freedom complex molecules have because that, that gets difficult. Okay, so, but here is one for you to try. What I've got here is a model of a crystal. Now I want you to consider this particle in the middle of the crystal. So it's surrounded by lots of partners and we can model the crystal as having bonds between it and bonds can have vibrations. So they've got springs here representing those vibrations. So what I want you to do is think about this crystal and try and work out how many degrees of freedom associated with translation, rotation and vibration you think this crystal would have. 